This talk is kind of attached to the first talk I gave a couple of weeks ago about how to study, why to study bears. And here I want to go a bit deeper into uh, what I am doing, or what we are doing here up at Swanhof. We are we are basically uh, monitoring bears with the use of so-called hair traps. So I, I do a quick recap of the uh, the talk I gave two weeks ago, just to remind you of a few things. So. Um, Brown bears were virtually wiped out for the, all of Europe, but uh, some of the populations have recovered now, like in the northern Europe, the Scandinavian and uh, the Finnish bear population. The Balkan population has also recovered to quite some extent, and then we have the other big one in Romania. There has been a few articles on it, just to remind you on this. Here's the current distribution of the brown bears in Europe to kind of uh, set the scene for this talk as well. So the, these red areas are uh, areas where the bear is um, permanently abundant. So you can always find bears in that area. We have these orange uh, shaded areas, which are more areas where the bears are occasionally uh, seen or observed. And then you have, of course, the green ones where the brown bears are actually absent. So you can see these big uh, areas in, in Scandinavia and Finland, Estonia, and then Romania, Balkan, and uh, Slovakia, and so on and so forth, the few spots in Italy and uh, Spain and uh, south uh, western France. So the current population estimate for Norway is about 120 bears. This is a minimum number. It's probably a bit more, probably up to 200. In Sweden, there are country about 2,800 brown bears. Finland has approximately 2,000 brown bears. Russia, the whole of Russia, including Eurasia, has approximately far over 100,000 brown bears, but nobody really knows. And then we have the small country of Estonia with a substantial amount of 700 bears in the country. Just to remind you, this was also part of my other talk, uh, how to actually monitor bears. Just to uh, remind you that bears are actually very difficult to monitor. There are different methods, and we all need, we need all of them. You can either observe them, so when people actually record the observation of brown bears. I've seen one there here, I've seen one there there. So this is recorded, and you can kind of get kind of an idea how many bears or dead bears are in the area. You can do track counting, or look at uh, scratching, or biting marks at trees. You can, of course, get an idea when you use dead bears or legally shot bears, uh, how many bears are in an area and how, um, how, how dense the population is. Then on the other hand, you can, of course, capture bears and uh, put uh, radio or GPS collars around them to study them. And then you, uh, you can use the so-called non-invasive genetic sampling techniques. <coughs> this is what I'm mainly referring to. So we, use, we collect biological samples like hair or feces or droppings and extract the DNA that's to uh, get the individual identification of the bear, and uh, that helps us actually to count the bears, how many bears are in the area. Just let me know if I'm too quick, but uh, I think time is a bit limited. So uh, I haven't talked about uh, where I am or where we are based in the last talk. So I'm working at Svanov, which is a research station in the far north of Europe at approximately 70 degrees uh, north. We are directly located at the border to Russia, and we are actually a very um, important center for uh, collaboration in the Barents area. You can see kind of a schematic back of the Barents area, which is defined by the Barents Sea up here. So we have collaborators from all of these uh, regions for different kinds of projects, uh, and one among them is Brown Bear. Just very quickly on Swanhoft or my group, we're working with several species. One of them is brown bear. This is um, actually our, has been our main focus for a long time, and it still is. But we're now working as well with polar bears from Svalbard, uh, doing genetic analysis for the Norwegian Polar Institute. We have a collaboration or project running with Canadians on grizzly and black bear. We work with Finnish uh, colleagues on uh, lynx. Uh, there are some small projects on red fox. Then we have other brown, uh, projects on brown trout, lumpfish, and geometric moths. These are special specific moths which are actually occur in cycles and kind of destroy all of the birch trees in an area where they are abundant. So uh, just to give you a very short glimpse of what we are doing, these are all projects mainly related to genetics. So these all genetic methods to kind of look uh, how they are doing. Here on the down picture, you can uh, see a small picture of Svanoft. We have a conference center, and our lab is located here, genetic lab. 
and it is here, and here you see the Pasvik River, which is the border river to Russia on the other, si other side. Uh, yeah, that's where we are working. We have the conference center and uh, also the visitor center for the uh, locally national park as well. So if you're up here, you're welcome to visit and you can even stay here. So uh, coming to the hair trapping project, we had several hair trapping projects, but I took this project out because it's, it is unique and it is very special for the area. So um, we have the national park. So this is Norway. This is kind of tip going down here. So it's a bit awkward actually to have uh, this kind of uh, land uh, stretch of land to the south of Norway. Then you have on the western part is Finland, and then on the other side we have Russia. And they have for some year now a like kind of common national park. So you have the Finnish protected areas here. You have the uh, national park in Norway, also is attached to the protected areas, and then you have some protected areas on the Russian side. So this is, uh, I refer to this as like inner, a part of Inari, which is more like here, the town of Inari, but uh, this is the municipality of Inari. And then we have Pasvik, which is the northern part, uh, the Norwegian part, and then we have the part of Peshenga, we call it, uh, on the Russian side. So this area is actually, uh, as I taught in the last talk, um, Compared to the rest of Norway, where bears were shot down and totally extinct, probably in this part of Norway, the bear was never completely extinct due to this wilderness areas, and especially connection to Russia. So people here actually were used to brown bears and uh, seeing signs of them. So in 2007, there was an initiative to, to, to uh, actually look how many bears are in this area, especially during, in these national park areas. And uh, we set up um, a so-called hair trapping project. I go in a second a bit deeper what that means. I just want to tell you a bit more about the project now. So the basic uh, question was how many bears are actually in the area? Is it maybe different in different countries? And then we should report results. And also this was a kind of initiative to strengthen the international transborder cooperation between Finland, Norway, and Russia. Uh, and that's why I thought this project is so, so unique. Normally, these wildlife species, they are normally monitored on a national level. So Sweden does a thing, Norway does a thing, but they're changing now, their correlation is very strong. But normally, across Europe, you monitor these uh, species um, on a national level. So this is very unique that we actually have three countries monitoring at the same time the same brown bear population. Because the point is the bears don't really care about the borders. They go over the borders. Of course, there might be some obstacles made by humans, but uh, they don't care about borders. So um, in that sense, uh, it makes sense to monitor actually uh, without uh, national um, uh, focus. And of course, we would like to use this results we get for, for research later. So here's a scheme of a hair trap. It basically consists of a barbed wire bent around three. And in the middle, we place some liquid lure. I will come later to that, what this is, to attract the bears. The important is that uh, the bear is attracted to the site, and it tries to enter the area of the trap. And while it enters, it will leave hair on the barbed wire. And with the barbed wire, it, you snag out uh, quite some hairs. And on the hair, you have a root. And in that root is a cell. And in that cell, you have the DNA of the bear. And that we we'll try to analyze, or we analyze. We will see more focus later. So the bear can either crawl under if it's small enough, or if it's quite a big bear, they go over it. So this is normally like 40 centimeters from the from the ground. Very quickly about the scheme. Um, I think Julia will tell you later about uh, uh, tomorrow, I think, and on the other day, about uh, how you use feces collection to, um, to study and monitor bears. And compared to feces, um, hair traps have the advantage that they can place systematically, so that we can either distribute them evenly and, uh, uh, across an area. So what you normally do with hair trapping is that you divide the research area into a grid of certain size. We use five by five kilometers, and in every grid, we place one of these hair traps. So that we get a quite an even distribution of traps across the area to get a, a good uh, impression of how where are the bears or where they are maybe not. 
So we check them every two weeks over a span of two months uh, if, we find, if there has been a bear there or has preferably left some hair and we collect it. And always after these two weeks, we will also review the scent lure, which attracts the bears, to keep it fresh. And after one month, we normally remove this trap within the same grid to another location, so that the bears in the area are not getting too used with the, where the trap is for the whole period of two months. And normally, uh, we, we place these hair traps not too close to human settlements. Of course, first year, people may be a bit concerned that they're attracting bears to their, their houses. And um, yeah, just to keep them also, the traps kind of undisturbed a bit from humans. So we, uh, prior, before we go out to the field, we select areas to look at the satellite pictures uh, and maps where we can actually place it, where actually also are trees, because we need trees to, to, to place uh, the wire. So some, some of this project, we had like 56 grids in total, 20 on the Norwegian side, 26 on the Finnish side, and 10 grids or traps on the Russian side. So we normally operate from mid-June to mid-August, and this is our render schedule, like after two, 14 days, we check if there's hair, remove the hair, remove the sand lure, and then after another 14 days, we check again, translocate. So it's quite a bit of a logistics uh, effort here especially in summer with the mosquitoes and the heat, uh, it can be quite demanding to the, to the field personnel. But it's still a good method. Okay, um, I just talked about you that you have to attract the bears to the area. And then I have a question for you. What would you assume? I know you maybe have not the right background, but you have heard stories about bears. So what do you think, how we actually attract the bears? Um, do we use A, honey, uh, B, meat? C, maybe sweets, or D, fish, E, uh, blood, or maybe a combination of fish and blood. Maybe you can give your, um, your opinion very quickly. Most people say uh, F, a uh, few people say A, but nothing in between, which is, um, yeah, I'm impressed. <laughs> um, it is a combination of blood and fish. But the most important thing is it has to be a liquid and there has to happen to be any protein in it so the bear doesn't get rewarded and actually stays around the area and tries maybe even to protect it against us coming to, to check the trap. So what we normally do is before we go to the field, some weeks before we get uh, fish waste, uh, preferably intestines from salmon eat fish, a very fatty fish remains and uh, mammalian blood from cattle or pigs. So then you store it in big containers separately, and then you let it ferment or rotten for many weeks. So it gets super liquid, um, and there's nothing anymore to eat in it, and uh, then we mix it, and that's what we use. So I can tell you it's really a um, disgusting smell, but the bears like it, and it's very effective. I don't need to tell you that you have to handle these things with very care, so you don't want to get it over your, your trousers and so on. So then they go, the people go out into the field. This is from Norway and Russia. So they go out, uh, place the traps with the barbed wire, spill it around it, and, uh, and always the last thing we do before we leave is put the lure at the center. So we normally use if we find some uh, more elevated areas uh, that are not totally on the ground, so that maybe the smell gets tr transmitted a bit longer or further away. So you see it's totally liquid. It, uh, normally the moss sucks it a bit in, so we use, prefer to use moss so it, it stays maybe a bit more uh, um, liquid and hydrated for a bit longer because we have midnight sun here, so it can dry out very quickly, or if it's raining a lot, of course, it can be washed away from the, from the tree like this. Here. This is another trap, how it basically looks like. Here's the spent barbed wire. So we don't use nails. We just spend it around so it doesn't have to be super tight. But of course, it doesn't have to be super, super loose. So it's actually very easy. Of course, you have to handle it a bit too carefully. It's barbed wire. So you have to use leather gloves. And we use branches to kind of uh, put it into the ditches or holes. So then you get a more or less even distance between the surface of this ground to the, to the barbed wire. And it has to be big enough that the bear actually has to enter the area to check this thing out here. 
Then we mount as well uh, um, wildlife or remote uh, sent or triggered cameras. This is from the 2007 project where they used actually wide cameras. They got it from the Polar uh, Fox um, um, project uh, borrowed because at that time we didn't have old cameras, so they borrowed some cameras which were white, and I come back later to that. This was very interesting. So, and then after two weeks, uh, we come back to the hair trap, and normally what the first thing you notice is if a bear was there, you find these kind of things in the center. You find digging and scratching, and uh, that is it's a strong, strong indication that the bear was there, because normally you don't see that footprint that well in the, in the moss, but sometimes you can actually. But when you see this, or this thing that it was totally scratched down, uh, then you can be certain there was a bear. And when you see these things, you can certainly uh, be very certain that you have hair on the wire. So that's how it normally looks like. You go around all this uh, wire, sometimes twice with your two persons that we don't miss any hair. So we use some kind of sheet of black and white paper to kind of uh, enhance the contrast along the wire to see if we uh, find some hair. But sometimes these things you can see by a normal eye immediately. You also notice there's no blood on it, so uh, I can already spoil. Uh, there's no harm to, to any kind of wildlife with a barbed wire. And normally also you find when there's also scratching and digging, you find a lot of hair for this, on this location too. So then we collect the hair in plastic bags, and actually every knot is one, one separate sample, and uh, yeah, everything is recorded, so it might take some time. Normally you don't need to use gloves, we actually use the gloves here because of the mosquitoes, because when you have to, this gives you the work with the hair and put them into paper envelopes, you have to be very concentrated and very stable and calm to do it, but of course with this, um, thousands of mosquitoes attacking your hand, it can be very challenging. Then we have the genetic analysis. So it goes to the lab, the DNA is extracted, amplified with a PCR, and you get the genetic profile. But uh, Julia will tell you more about this, I think tomorrow and it's next week. And I think for next week there are still places left. So she will talk about uh, the extraction of DNA from bare feces or bare poop, which is basically the same method. So you extract the DNA and analyze it. So Yuda will tell you much more about the technical aspect of this analysis. So um, what do you think? How many bears we have detected? It was an area of 1,400 square kilometers. I mean, we can go just very quickly back. Yeah. So I know you maybe don't know, but maybe you just guess how many bears we actually detected in that area. What do you think? A, zero? Uh, B, 10 to 50, or uh, maybe 60 to 100? I get a question on the 50s and 90s. I think it's the same, uh, uh, same lecture from Julia. Exactly the same title and uh, supposed to be the same content, yes. Okay, I got uh, mainly C, I would say. The majority says C, and uh, some others say B. Okay, let's take a look. But remember these numbers, it will be very interesting because here we talk about how many bears we actually detect, and later I will tell you how many bears are actually in the area. So this is going to be interesting. So here we did it already three times, 2007, 2011, and 2015. We analyzed uh, a look at the bears. And in 2007, we detected 24 bears. In 2011, 20. And in 2015, we had 26 bears. So the number of bears is more or less stable in the area. So you can see as well for the different countries we had. What is striking is a bit the difference in the number of samples. So we of course detect uh, more than one sample from one individual bear. So we have 196 samples in 2007, 88, 
in 2011, it was a not much bear activity that year, and also the weather was very bad. And uh, then again, 209 samples in 2015. So of course, we, we you can't. You will probably tell me more about this in, in the thesis collection. Of course, you don't get DNA out of every sample, since the, the the hair samples are exposed to the environment like sun and rain. The DNA might might degrade very quickly, especially when there's a lot of heat and sunshine on it. So that of course uh, kind of uh, um, influences the we call it success rate how much DNA you get out of your samples. So in some samples simply don't work because there's no DNA content. And no, but normally the success rate is around 70%. So like over two thirds uh, of the samples are, are working and are successfully in, in AI amplification. So the, the, as you see from the numbers here, from the minimum number, so these are the pairs that we are detected in the, in the area, it's quite stable. But on the Norwegian part, we have a small increase, we have nine, 11, 16. Not substantially, but it's notable that there's a few more individuals. This picture is from Russia. Well, there's a female with three cups. So you're, they really like it. You can see it later in the video. Uh, just quickly, some results. Um, as I said, you usually get more than one sample from one individual. Few individuals we get only once, but also a lot of individuals we get more than once. So for instance, so among, among different years, like seven bears we detected in 2011, we also detected in uh, 2015. And four, we finally sampled in 2007, we also find again in 2015, which is nice, because a lot of bears might die, migrate away, you know, just vanish. And since this is a transborder um, project, it's also interesting how many bears are actually uh, detected in more than one country. So two bears were detected in two countries, and one individual we detected in Finland, Norway, and Russia during the same time. So we are aware of that some bears are actually have uh, their territory directly at the border, so they share their, their home range um, among the three countries, which is quite interesting because we have this kind of big river in the middle especially to, uh, between uh, Norway and Russia. So what if, uh, one of the major uh, uh, things as well you should remember that hair trapping, we can actually uh, substantially increase the number of samples and some, uh, some uh, substantially increase the number of individuals we detect. So normally this is an area where not many people are going, especially not that time of the year, there's not, not berry season yet, no, not mushroom picking yet. So um, we get a lot of information about an area uh, where we normally don't get anything, or just already scarce. But then uh, in 2012, we did the population estimate. So we used this data we gathered here and plus the data collected by, uh, by thesis collection. And there are different methods, statistical methods. I don't want to go deep into that, but you can calculate based on previous research with other bear population, home range size, and so on bear density, how many bears are actually in the area. So the estimate was roughly between 50 to 70 brown bears in this uh, area of Pasig in area, So just that's what I said, what I remind you, we have the minimum number of 20, 30 bears in the area, but actually if you um, use statistical methods to, to really look at how many bears are in the area, then you come more to this uh, C answer, like 50 to 70 bears. So I think that is quite interesting and uh, notable. Just a very quick comparison about where we actually detect the bears in the area between the two years. And you basically see it's always the same area at that time of the year where the bears are. It's never shifting. What is very interesting, of course, for the management uh, is we have this road going here, going down here to the uh, three, three uh, corners here to the, to the, where the three countries meet. And the bears are actually not close to humans, but in an area where also human exists. So it's a, it's a coexistence, especially on the Norwegian part. While this area is on the, on the Russian and Finnish part, is, uh, there's no people living really. There might be some uh, rare cottages, but nothing else. So especially the national park area in Norway at that time of the year is quite uh, absent of bears. Uh, so it's assumed because there's no berries yet, and there's much more food on the grasslands and near the river.
Again, when we you get more than one sample of one individual, and maybe across years, but maybe also within all the same season, you get an idea whether the individual bears are actually roaming or actually maybe have the home range. Because sampling area is something different than home range. This is a statistical method I kind of mentioned, but you get a kind of idea where these individuals live. So we have, for instance, this, these are females, female bears, and they tend to have this overlapping home ranges, or here in this term, overlapping sampling areas. So you see a lot of state quite uh, in, uh, on the Norwegian part here, but this is mainly due to lack of samples from the Russian side or Finnish side. I mean, that was again another reason why we used this hair trapping because we can actually get samples from the other parts of the country more systematically. We get hair, uh, pieces of samples from Norway and um, from Russia and Finland, but not that uh, continuously and not that constantly. So, uh, because in Norway we have this national monitoring scheme, every year all the feces are collected, uh, which are found and analyzed. So that's why we have actually very good uh, um, information about the brown bears in whole Norway, and especially also in this area. But I will, this I will talk later, I think in September, about the monitoring of brown bears in, in Norway. We have to rush a bit, I think. We use this as well, not only for the for uh, for this particular project. This is another project we did last year. This is the northern part of Paswick. One of this located here, and also we detected quite five new individuals. I just want to highlight this was very important for the management because at that time no bears were observed at all in that area. Although there's quite a lot of people living here across, along the road, up to Hirkenes here, so in that sense it was very successful. We also applied the same method uh, around the farm. There was some incidents or like observed uh, bears around the farm here. We did this, uh, a small version of this hair traffic project for only four weeks. We had this area around the farm and then we had a control area which was a bit more remote. And what was striking, it was mainly males around the farm, this blue ones, this blue dots. And uh, the females would tend to stay more in this more remote area uh, away from uh, people. And what was also interesting is that in every week, it was always a different male bear around the farm. So that uh, was a very nice information to see that the bears actually not hang around the farm and so waiting there. We just roam through the area and then they are gone. But we also had one female checking out one week uh, near the farm. Uh, very quickly, you can use, also collect hair from power poles. So we have these power lines. And uh, that is uh, that has two two reasons. First of all, bears like to scratch. They like to mark uh, uh, the territory, and maybe due to other reasons also to to attract uh, uh, mating partners. But this biology is also not really understood yet. How they and why they're actually doing it, what does it really mean? Because not every bear is doing it. There's also individual differences. But um, that is the one reason, the biological reason, that they like to scratch of poles and uh, marking uh, marking places. But also, these um, poles they're impregnated with some kind of tar, oil-based uh, uh, impregnant, and um, this kind of smells very heavily. You can smell it even after years when you stand beside this pole, and this also attracts the bears. So. Um, Especially the colleague Alexandros from Greece, he does he did extensive studies in Greece along the power poles because he couldn't build that many hair traps everywhere. He just go along the, 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 the power lines and collect the hairs, and it was quite successful. So you can find hair actually from the power poles, but for us it was not that successful. So we had here this power line, 2013 and 14, we sampled. We cut quite a lot of samples the first year, but this was probably an accumulation of many years. When we repeated the next year, we got much less samples. But I have to say the success rate, we only could use like 30% or even less. I think it was even 15% only of the samples for DNA analysis. So that was not really worthwhile doing it. But it depends, of course, on the sampling interval. If we use only two weeks, it might work. But it's also a big effort to walk this line every two weeks. But it can be, it can be used. So let's go to the remote cameras very quickly. Uh, in 2007, we started this project, as I said, from the, uh, with the white camera boxes from the Polar Fox Institute. And uh, when the team arrived there, they found, I don't, I don't know, it was not all, but most of them were actually destroyed. 
course, uh, first uh, uh, initial uh, assumption was that maybe some people were there smashing it or whatever, but, but who would do it? But you can see already it was, it was quite, quite heavily damaged. And of course, um, we checked the, the footage. And uh, you find, of course, other animals uh, visiting this, tri uh, this site because they're attracted. I mean, it smells like cadaver. Also, other uh, um, opportunist uh, feeders are coming, like red fox and others. And uh, we have pictures of this uh, two young males. The one is checking out the, the lure in the middle. And the other one is moving towards the camera already. So uh, you can see it also from other videos, they detect the camera immediately. And they get very close sometimes. So, and, um, and what was very remarkable, one of the bears, uh, because all of this um, were on photo mode at that time in 2007, because of battery life and so on. But in 2007, one of these bears who actually destroyed the camera and he, he was able to switch on the movie mode while playing with the camera. So uh, this I will play now for you. Yeah, they are, I mean, they are really, really coming close to the, the cameras. Uh, I, have, I have a lot of other movies. Um, but before I show you the last movie, I can go to the last slide, which was also at the point I wanted to strike. We use not only the camera to kind of see how funny the bears are moving, we also want to see it's actually, can this uh, barbed wire cause some damage to any kind of uh, human who come maybe come across or other animals, and we know, from our project we never saw any any damages of bears or animal suffering or anything from that. So uh, it moves who come across their reindeer. So I will show you this movie uh, now, and I think then I could take questions also while while this movie is running. But you can always watch this movie several times on, under this address. I maybe can copy it here on the on the, on the chat board. And then we compiled all the footage you can see here from 2015 from this hair trapping project of the bears and the, the cubs are actually behaving. So I will just play this movie and um, I think that's all for now. I hope I didn't forget anything. If you have any questions, please um, ask them now or uh, send them to me by email. <laughs>